let's see. When I first thought of organizing this course, I was thinking about the past, I took a look back, and I realized that that was edition number 42 that I was opening, officially opening in this school. So it was eight years because I spent my whole career here, seven years, that was what we used to do. So it's been about 50 years, half a century that I've been here in this institution. Anyway, I'm really enthusiastic about this because, well, I have the will and uh, I'm excited. Uh, just like the day when I began, when I began studying, then when I began teaching here, that was in 7071. This lecture I wouldn't have given years ago and I wouldn't have done this because I didn't have the experience of the instant city in Ibiza uh, there were some bright times and darker times and it was Yago Yago Conde you see him here it was a teacher who died one of the professors that course with Enrique Miralles who's not in the picture because Enrique was always traveling and you know giving speeches all around the world but as you can imagine Torres Nadal, Luis Sainz, Roberto Terradas, Antonio San Martin and Enrique Miralles is not in the picture and some other teachers who well, joined us uh, back then in this year 1993 in this case and Diago was one of the young professors he had studied in Yale in Colombia in the United States and he came back with brilliant ideas and every year he used to say Carlos you must tell them about the instant city in 1971 because it's good for students to you know know the story and know what happened back then and I would tell him look Yago don't make me explain this because I just don't feel like it it's true that I have like 20 files in my office full of material they're full of materials and some are in the exhibition at the MACBA for this retrospective exhibition, but I didn't want to. And the year that Iago, it was a, it was a tragedy, uh, he died, and well, he, well, we witnessed the very last moments here in, in the school. It was about the summer when I stopped seeing him, when we began the course, he had already died. So it's like a tribute to Iago, who was a great architect, uh, you know, great professor and very, very nice person. So I opened the course with a lecture on the instant city. It was a little bit disorganized with pictures that I had and many files. But well, I've tried to structure that talk now for you from the ideological perspective. I think there is an ideological background, uh, you know, behind what I'm going to tell you. I mean, Iago has been the promoter of what uh, we are going to be doing here and now with this presentation. So as you begin, every, as you will understand, everything began in May 68 in Paris. It was a month maybe the first time when students and workers uh, employees went out in the streets and, and, and demonstrated uh, especially with their that motto you know imagination uh, is power and they took the streets in Paris and those people they changed the world we still have the memories there are some you know remnants and fringes of that year May 68 because as I say I believe that many things changed back then. The outraged people now in the streets, uh, well, they have their reasons, of course, but many years have, have gone by anyway. Let's go back to that. 68, then in 69, a phenomenon appeared in the United States. The uh, communities in the free universities, Berkeley, California, and the great uh, worldwide Woodstock Festival was uh, organized. That was in the New York State, I think, in a place near the city of Vermont. And then, you know, millions, thousands of people gathered there to organize this festival and to create, I would say, some new way of understanding the world. Then other people came and other 
festivals came, the most um, symbolic one, that in the Island of White in the 70, 1970, 68, 69, 70, 71, and then we gathered in Ibiza. It was not music, the reason taking us there, but design and architecture, the reasons that gathered you know, together people from all over the world to organize a huge event, huge event devoted to working, to sharing information, leisure, culture in Ibiza in the summer, September, October 1971. Which was the reason we thought, let's say, the reason behind that enabled us to organize the instant in 1961, you know, this bunch of gentlemen here with their suits, wearing their suits, belonging to the International Council of Societies of Industrial Design, the worldwide organization that grouped together all the design uh, organizations. They met in uh, Venice. Uh, you see a Venetian uh, uh, plant factory here in 1961 and in Spain uh, that didn't exist. Uh, Spain was an outcast country in this sense. So uh, many designers, Spanish de designers, Ricard, Mila, Boiga, some people that back in the 60s uh, started to, well, make their voices heard, especially from Catalonia as a, as a region that was closest to Europe back then. So they started the, to, to ask the organizers of the Congress to be taken into account. And even if Spain was under some sort of political veto because of the dictatorship, they wanted to be given the opportunity, precisely because they wanted to understand culture from protest. And, well, they well, granted the possibility to organize the 1971 Congress to ADI, FID, FI, FID. Adi Fad. Well, Adi Fad, because it was a Catalan institution, it's the Industrial Design Association, that's what FAD stands for, and it was a very relevant entity from the point of view of design, and it was renowned throughout the world as well. So Adi Fad was to be the organizer of the Ibiza Congress in 1971. Okay, let's... Uh, Start with the Congress in the 1970. We began uh, preparing the Congress. That's the poster that you can see with a lock that had to be open. It was a good design, good design with the door and the lock. And there is a message here conveyed by the poster in itself. You know, there's there's a lock that needs to be opened and needs to be unlocked. Anyway, the board at the FAD back then made up of Andres Ricard, Blanc, Ferran Freixa, Daniel eh, Miralles, Frances Pernas, Antonio Moragas as president of the FAD. The uh, Oriol Vigas, Federico Correa, all those people, well, met together and they started to organize the Congress. Back then, I was a student, like you all, and I was studying here in this very institution. This uh, enlargement had not been built yet, we were in the old building of the school, and I had gone and I had joined an architect uh, office belonging to Celi Yosa, and I started helping there like crazy trying to learn. I, I, I couldn't join the Coderc studio because they, well, the vacancies were all, were all full, so we did the studies here and I I uh, did some practice work there, amongst other things, lectures and demonstrations and assemblies and, you know, running in front of the police and, and, and fights and everything. So we had to earn our life when we organized a group of students in at school, Pancho, Javier, Roma. He was a delegate at the Democratic Union. I was an info information delegate, but there was also Anna Bofil and other professionals, not, not only belonging to the school, but Pepe Cortez designer, interior designer, photographers, etc. We all organized the open design group called Urquinaona, and we rented a space at the Urquinaona Tower, and we started doing, well, making our way in an unintentional way in the beginning, like these groups of people in Madrid now. But anyway, since it didn't 
quite work, we realized we split. I went with my brother, with Borja Arque, and uh, with Fernando Bendito, another student, very good friend of mine, studying together with me. We went to the FAD to ask them if we could do something for the Congress, if we could help in any way in the organization of the Congress. The rest of the members of the Urquinaona group, they, all, they also went to the FAD, and they were taken uh, officially, they were hired in the organization of the Congress, and when Fernando and I arrived, there was nothing for us. They said, well, look, there's nothing for you to do, you know, these, there's these, these two guys there uh, helping us, and there's not much you can do. But then, in the end, they said, well, there's something that we haven't uh, quite organized yet. What is it? A camp, a camping site for the students that want to join us, because there will be the delegates at the Congress, and they will stay at the hotel. But if the students come, there will be, that will be good, you know, to have some place uh, for them to stay. And there's a plot of land, a uh, 15,000 uh, meters that they could take so, you, you know, they could organize their tents. What's the What's the budget? It's 10,000 pesetas. 10,000 pesetas? Yeah, but we will be giving that amount to you, uh, you know, in a split fashion, 100 and then another 100 as you, as you need them. Well, we signed a small contract and that's the way we began. We started doing the following. We wanted to do a counter congress together with uh, Fernando. Well, but we were so, so small faced to the whole congress. But, you know, there's, there was this international congress. Uh, so we wanted to convene their people who were not only official designers, renowned prestigious designers, you know, coming from their countries to stay in those uh, hotels and do their seminars and speeches. No, we wanted to gather together in Ibiza all, you know, all all the other people from the world of design, culture, to discuss architecture, to, to debate. So we called Luis Racionero, who came from Berkeley, California, in the United States. And then, well, he helped us uh, write down a uh, first uh, manifesto. And he helped a lot because he gave us enormous amounts of directions uh, from universities and connections, professors, teachers, students, people from the communities in San Francisco. And those lists were fantastic. That's a little extract uh, from the manifesto saying seems like things like the world is preparing for a metamorphosis of the gods, the values are abandoned, archetypes of the uh, culture in force will be left aside, we will adopt new ways of life, being born from another vision of the world, these new values of the new culture is that it's change itself. You know, people that have based their their lives in a different in a different way, in a kind of a journey, mental, geographic. It's the lack of permanence of this new uh, lifestyle that reaches its limits with festivals gathering together thousands of people, creating an instant th city, an instantaneous city like a sacred place. And the city dissolves back then. It's fascinating. It, it's a city for nomadic people that appear in one place and dissolve when the last dwellers abandon it. That's the topic that we wanted to to prepare together for all the designers from all over the world. And the nest for all of this is Ibiza. The youngsters of this new culture will be gathering together and we will listen to music and we will dance and we will build this space and we will live together for a few days. So come join us in Ibiza to create the instant city. That was the manifesto, and we started to prepare it, and we would send it. We used silk paper because we didn't want it to be that heavy because the envelopes were expensive, and the poster was designed by my brother, who was a photographer. We studied, he was studying at the graphic uh, design school, Aina, back then. He was studying photography, and he prepared this this rainbow for the, for the the like the dawning of the rainbow for the poster. I only have one copy left. I believe it's at the Magba, they're keeping it there. So then the moment came to start thinking about how to organize it. Because, you know, people from all over the world were going to come and we were sending letters and we had huge, brutal responses. A month later, 
we had more uh, communications. We, in our tiny little office at the, at the basement, three times three square meters, that, well, with, the, with an Olivetti-type writer there that I had brought from, from home, and there we would write our texts, and we had a little machine to do the copies, and we were sending those letters flooding the whole world, the U.S., India, Nordic countries. We were sending letters to Japan, and we heard about heard them talk about metabolism, you know, during times of chaos, and, and we, we sent letters to Finland and Argentina, especially Chile, Mexico, Latin American countries, that they, they were then with their, their theater groups and, and, and fight clubs and, and mimes, and everything, you know, started taking such a size, such a dimension, that the Congress organizers, well, became scared and and we, well, that called for our attention because we, we saw that what we were doing was, was big. And then came the materials, you know, cardboards and resins, because I had had some experience and we went to the company, see the company Resisa, and they said, yes, we convinced them, then they gave us some resin, we, we did some tests and we looked for the cardboards, but it was very complicated. And and that, uh, with, a, with a group of people, we were thinking about geodesics, like with PVC tubes and uh, a thin layer of plastic film, small inventions like these geodesics, because Fuller was doing something like that in the 50s, 60s. And we thought that that was good. It was simpler than doing it with the resin, but anyway, it was well, not that easy, it was complex, so we started thinking about the bubbles and the air and the inflatables, and then we said, okay, maybe we could build some inflatables with a, with a fan, with some ventilation device, with slight overpressure, a plastic, plastic film, and I, well, we think we can make that. So what did we do? We sent a letter, a document or two, saying, well, since we know that these inflatables can be used, that they, they have been used in the University City of Madrid, we are addressing you with the hope that you can help us in this project. The inflatable in question fits uh, with our objectives. It would be ideal, so please help us uh, if you can. We would like to know whether you can help us. And that was a letter that we sent to Jose Miguel de Prada. He was a professor at the school in Madrid, a great inventor himself, knowledgeable of the pneumatic architecture, uh, inflatables, a hippie guy, fantastic, crazy guy. Wonderful back then. So, what is it we did? Fernando and myself went to visit the plastic plant in Sardagnola and we said, well, here, we came here to offer you a present. It's a gift because we have an idea and then, we, you know, this will advertise your company and you'll be famous all over the world. You'll be sending plastic like, like water. Yes, yes, because we, uh, well, you will give us a certain amount of PVC and we will do something with these people that will come from all over the world, from free universities. It's like a pneumatic city that we want to, to create in Ibiza with the help of Prada Pool. It will help us with the design. And they were looking at us like, you're crazy. Uh, because, you know, that amounted like one million pesetas back then. And that was an enormous amount at the time. Anyway, in the end, uh, some Mr. Reyes met with us, and fortunately he was a businessman, but he was a well, great guy, a little bit crazy, very imaginative, imaginative man. And then thanks to him, he said, well, I would like to help you, but, you know, the board, the management board will say that I'm crazy and I'm the chief of marketing. And, and we said, what if we prepare a demo? A demo, yeah, we can go to the fabric next to your fabric in Sardagnola and we will create this inflatable in one, two days and we will show you what we want to do. Okay, uh, let's do that. So I called home and the technical experts and, and the engineers and uh, I Condel and the chemists and for 48 uh, hours we were using adhesive tape and, and cuts of plastic and we did what we called the first pepito. And that pepito inside, that's the way it looked, with Prada pool and me here in the picture once built. 
So when they entered, well, actually it rained and there was mud all over the place. It was dirty, disgusting. It was kind of repulsive, you know, uh, with this ditch of, 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 of soil and the chemists came and because that had to be done. It was a, it was a show in itself and everybody started laughing. But then we used the ventilation device and then, well, it all took shape, took form and it uh, became what you're seeing here. And there was a door that you had to use, like a, a little, you know, slit that you had to use to get inside the circular hole. And uh, there was some tension in a, in a rope to make the, the door rigid. And then, you know, came the chemists with their white coats and other guys with their suits and their ties and they became quite impressed they were impressed and they said well you guys are crazy you're nuts but we're going to be helping you we're in in this story and they gave us the plastic material and well we then added the colors and we asked some conditions but well we had the material to begin with and Prada Poo was happy enough because with this he could start working. And then then we went to Ibiza, Tala San Miguel. Why Ibiza? Because it was a place it was a permissive place back then in the you know, those terrible times in Spain. Maybe Caracas would have been nice, but that was in the north of the, the, the Costa Brava. Very, very very small city but Ibiza was the place with the hippies the hippies started to go there and there was some tourism and it was not that you know under surveillance not that monitored if you see what I mean it like they didn't they didn't care that much the repressive establishment didn't care that much about what was going on in Ibiza the island was not that dangerous as they perceived it so it was a it was a success choosing Ibiza and there were two hotels in the north of the island, that's Cala San Miguel, and those uh, hotels had been built, you know, based on a project by Raymond Torres, he was the municipal architect of Ibiza, and he, he could help us. He was the son of Torres Clave, a partner of Luis Cerd, who died in the Battle of Ebro, and the, he was a great architect, he believed, he built the Casa Blog, the ACs, it belonged to the Gat Pack and group of architects, very important, very important guy. But, well, he died in times of war, but, but he left enough a proof of his, of his value as an architect. So he was, Raymond was a son, and he had inherited some of the ACs, and, and with his help, with his help, we went to figure out the, um, the house where we met Pau Riva, and we met people that we invited as well, you know, those crazy hippie guys, we wanted, we wanted them to come to the instant city, and then came Pau, Pau Riva, and, well, I'm going to read you a few paragraphs of what we were sending people, that we, was, we had sent a manifesto, and people had replied to us, people who wanted to come, or who were thinking about coming, and then we would write to them again, saying, we will build minimum infrastructure with networks of energy and info uh, office and a consultation office and that will be in September 5th to 20th and after of day 21 everybody will build their own room module and we will design and build zones together and free common spaces and we will have 15,000 square meters of PVC in different colors. We hope that this community life will ease all sorts of spontaneous artistic manifestations if we take into account especially that we will have groups of you know people belonging to the theater the world of theater music and the mime and the city the life in the city will be a show there's no programming we will only be sharing information and working we have thinking of uh, creating a, a huge shop where in worst case scenario you can buy low cost uh, well first need food but we would like to provide you with basic food uh, for free like like bread and rice and vegetables it's free registration you just need to tell us when you're arriving because we will reserve 20 places in the in the boat that, that, that leaves Barcelona daily and comes to Ibiza. We, we need to know when you're coming. There will be boats also sailing from Valencia and Alicante. So please bring your sleeping bags and, and eating utensils. We hope for to get your news, to reply. There will be a commission to, to welcome you in Ibiza and we, ha we hope you can help us too. Peace. And then 
everything began and, 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 and people starting to reply and they came and in September we organized the first assembly in Ibiza. What, um, what did we talk about then? Because the instant didn't exist, so we will be sleeping in sleeping bags in this area, huge area, and some terraces behind the hotels and in the open air. And we would eat together and sleep together with some little stoves. And people came, it was fantastic people who came. And Fernando Benito, that's him, and that's me, and that's Fernando. And there's people that you might recognize here, Fernando Amat, there somewhere, because Fernando, Fernando Amat is from Vincent, you know. He was the first one to arrive on, on the boat. And he said, I want to work. I want to be with you. I want to join you guys. What, what do I need to do? I, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to, to work. You know him. So we said, well, there's this inflatables and and you could do maybe something else. Uh, and he said, anything i mean and and we said well the the, the toilets i mean we haven't quite solved the, the toilet issue and we said okay I'll, I'll do that and he created the instant toilets and he you know looked for the for the bricks and the uh, concrete blocks and he built some sort of thing and the, the toilet so faranamat from benson imagine that was the level you know that everything was taken and there was patrick the belgian guy we would call him he had a van and he had you know brought his van in the boat and he would go and look for food from the farmers nearby to organize this shop that we wanted to to organize so the first inflatable would be the store for the shop you'll see that later and those were the very first steps from then on, Jose Maria Prada had created a grammar, a working syntax with which these uh, maps, these uh, drawings, the different uh, patterns we started to create, uh, to build up some tables or in open air, to cutting plastics, creating different uh, crescents, different spheres. In principle, he had to work only with spheres and cylinders and create a, a city that was absolutely organized because Josep Maria Prada is absolutely Cartesian. Everything, he's very it's crazy and very hippie, but at the same time, he's very focused. And of course, Fernando and I, with other guys we, who were with us, said, oh, what, what, Josep Maria, give us a little bit more freedom. And so, no, 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 no. This is it, uh, how we have to do it. And he t started teaching us all over the all, all, all over the place. Well, we started building, but the surprise, well, we had a problem. The problem was the scotch tape. The scotch tape uh, detached after some days, and uh, it had been good for the Pepito in Sardagnola for a demo, but to be there for a whole month, it wasn't, it, it wouldn't do. And Prada, and Prada, who's a genius, of course, okay, we started uh, stapling, and we used uh, scotch tape or stapling, but, but we stapled the tension, uh, detached the staple, and it uh, broke the plastic. So invented and fold. Look at how simple it is. We ended up uh, stapling one million staples in the instant that uh, were given to us by Post-it. I think that we had uh, 20 some staplers, uh, those, those hand staplers. And what happens with this fold? Now, with the fold that he created, when the tension uh, draw. Uh, uh, drags at the plastic because of this overpressure doesn't the, the, the joint doesn't suffer anymore because it doesn't uh, work it doesn't move that is the fold allows for no suffering even if there's a lot of tension look at the height of sophistication sophistication of such a simple thing and this uh, fold was invented by Josep Maria for this purpose and we started with the drawings okay we're now going to build up the common spaces then the cells and this is how it's going to end oh my, my god can we do can we do anything more flexible yes but then the big surprise came the big surprise because of course what was the starting point of the city? A head uh, with public spaces, a large corridor, and then organization in cells that would be adding up, adding up, adding up, adding up, and then you have, and each would have their own cell, and everybody would contribute to have common areas, common spaces. Well, we started to work. How do you do that? 
Well, once you have done the inflatable uh, with the pieces, the staples, and then you leave a very long mesh, so you create um, uh, a trench, and then you created uh, the, the you, you put you place the mesh in the trench, and we uh, put we poured the same soil that we had. Uh, taken out for the trench. And this is how we started with a ventilator. The ventilator was the secret. The ventilator were given to us by Sole Palau. We went to see Mr. Sole Palau when we already had the plastic before the post-it and the staplers. And Sole Palau gave us 40, 50 ventilators for free. They were great and they provided overpressure. And uh, it's a, a relative overpressure if uh, you were in a sky scraper in uh, on floor 80 or 100, no more overpressure than that, but sufficient at uh, ground level for very high tension. And the only relationship is that tension is directly proportional to radio curvature, and the, the higher, the, the larger the radius of the curvature, the larger the pressure. And uh, and then Jose Maria didn't want that because we said, okay, this uh, needs to be communicated because this is where we keep the tools, the staplers, the ventilators, uh, the shop. Uh, this is where we had everything. It was a little bit more under surveillance. And we did uh, the inflatable in red and white stripes. And this is a logistics uh, store which wasn't inhabited. So the city started growing. And in the interior, life began. Look at this. There are large contradictions here. On the one hand, it was extraordinarily sophisticated what we were doing, and at the same time, it was absolutely cut rate, dirty even, uh, disgusting. That was the first large contradiction. And the second uh, contradiction, something that involved a lot of technology, high technology, particularly back then, pneumatic uh, structures, the calculus of a certain complexity uh, in terms of descriptive geometry. And on the other hand, it was completely handicraft. You know, you get uh, saw hands from stapling, 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 cutting, 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 cutting with uh, scissors and with a stapler, we will be able to build that city. Okay, technology and handicraft on the other side. And you will see it. You will see it later on. Chaos and order. You had order that uh, Josep Maria Prada wanted to have and the chaos that Fernando and I were so interested in. And I think that provided the perfect conditions because only with chaos it would have been a disaster. It would have only been dirty. Only with technology, only with handicraft, only sophistication, we, have, we wouldn't have achieved anything. The sum of all these contradictory parameters is what uh, made for this wonderful little experience. What you see here are vaginal type doors to enter. That is, you enter with the two uh, folded sheets through a cylinder that in reverts over itself, and then you uh, you you press and it uh, closes behind you so that no air is lost. We had diaphragms in order to control the pressure. And in the Pepito, well, uh, this is a common space for assemblies. What, uh, this is one of many assemblies. Usually they were at uh, sundown at, uh, with this wonderful uh, dawn, uh, with this wonderful sunset uh, light, with uh, colorful inflatables, with wonderful light. Look, this is a wonderful light that you can see here. Then, and I think it was very interesting when we had the uh, assemblies, this wonderful um, atmosphere of light, of overpressure color, futuristic uh, atmosphere on the other hand, you can see it's kind of a cheap course at the beginning, before we built many cells, people slept in the corridors until uh, they began uh, building up their own cells and people, well, what happened is that people start getting enthusiastic and then the cells were occupied and the corridors and the whole pepito was occupied, as you will see, it's a large space, uh, people lived everywhere, and you can see some inner spaces, how they lived, it was somewhat incredible 
people that are used living in communities, in communities such as the Indian or the U.S. communities, people that were extremely prepared for this kind of life. There was no single conflict, not one single conflict with people used to living in a little apartment uh, uh, with their fridge and the yogurt that ate, well, it would have been different, but people were used to living like that. You can see here the pepito, not so much with assemblies, but the people who had just arrived and uh, built their own cells to sleep. Before that, they slept uh, in this common space. And this wonderful thing, this man entering uh, through one of the doors, whereas in the inflatables, uh, we created the corridors with transparent bands in order to have some relationship with the exterior, which was very beautiful as well. Reception of life and so on. And you can see the intersections of corridors that lead to other smaller corridors that lead to the pneumatic cells that were spheres or little cylinders. And this wonderful thing, you remember Ruskin, I think that he said that a cave was the first habitat of man, but a cave, a cavern, is without architecture. When you hang a, a, a bear skin on the door, it's architectural. All right. And he explained it marvelously. Look at this, uh, this cut of, pla of uh, excess plastic that uh, creates a fringe, a curtain that uh, moves slightly because of the air and the uh, overpressure. And this is a wonderful atmosphere. It becomes a little house. Now, until now, the cells are pneumatic. And this is already has the value of a small house. Instant uh, grew and multiplied and reproduced. And this is at full performance. I'm going to show you, to tell you some anecdotes because they have somewhat something to do with what I told you, with this more ideological kind of uh, thing. There are people who didn't want to live in community with others, they want to live apart, so what did they do? They gathered air with the tube and they built their inflatable outside, separated from the other. And maybe a weird man or weird woman who didn't want excessive promiscuity. There were even some fami family cells, a small family that wanted to be isolated, not with those hippies that uh, spend the whole day playing guitar and singing and doing mime and theater and uh, assaulting hotels and so on. And look at how peculiar. At, some mo at, at, at a certain point in time, well, it's clear that large surprise uh, also was for Jose Maria Prada. Uh, a lot of well, well high qualified people came, uh, hi highly qualified from the academic point of view. There were great architects or architect students, but really good. They were used to, to studying in American universities where everything is done by hand. So very, very soon a double issue arises. The city is a city, amorphous city that doesn't have any monuments, that doesn't have representative uh, uh, places or sites, icons as we would call them now. And on the other hand, very highly qualified people who uh, are very able to do anything and, you know, just doing arcs and uh, cutting spheres was very boring for them. So there was a, a tree there, and this is the first uh, step at sustainability, uh, environmental, um, environmental conscience in the year 71. A wonderful inflatable was uh, created with the air of the city, but it's a site, it's a monument, it's a, a, a a site, a site for the city, an icon for the city. People went there, you went, you take them, you took them to see the tree inflatable. And in, in truth, it would have been very easy to say that they were very repressive, but they didn't. They weren't very pre pre repressive. Why? Because if there weren't uh, any political issues in uh, Franco Spain, there was a certain permissivity, a leniency, particularly with two topics uh, the Guardia Civilis, very macho, very earthbound uh, people, and then uh, erotism and soft drugs. 
Of course. They told me, they knew that Fernando and I organized, and Fernando was even crazier than myself. They came to me because they thought I was a little bit more normal and said, look, uh, tell them that they, tell them to hide this uh, shit because uh, we, uh, it, everything is in, on, si on plain sight and it's going to be dangerous for us. Please hide it in a sleep, sleeping bag or something. And uh, they continued to do, you know, looking the other way, and some even helped us work. And okay, and we dedicated this tricorn to the Guardia Civil Police Corps. And it was, I think, uh, uh, a little bit of sense of humor, with, and also very strange and interesting inflatable. And then those vaginal doors, this is a very beautiful photography. We pr submitted it when they were, we were invited to participate in the architecture exhibition in Santa Monica in Pizza, a professor of the school who was the curator of that exhibition, chose this picture as the cover of the catalog for the exhibition. This this a picture and you can see this, the things that, that it says. Look. You get in there as you would get into an ass. You see an, exting an, an extinguishing device here because uh, PVC was very dangerous because uh, also when it burned, it uh, uh, released hydrochloric acid. That is, you had to be very careful and you needed the extinctor. And then we reached what? What was happening there? A series of stories and one were like, uh, yeah, you know, parties like the Miralda, food, colors and so on. Things that were organized by the conference, by the Congress, and that uh, really ended up badly because they went to the instant and the Congress delegates uh, were felt guilty. They preferred to come to sleep at the instant than their hotels. They wanted to be with the fun people, the theater groups and the mime groups assaulted the hotels to see if they could get any food and they could take showers in the rooms. And uh, then they left the rooms to, uh, to the hippies to take showers and then there was, you know, the life was a continuous happening. And uh, uh, certain montadas uh, created such a happening uh, with a huge tube, with a mask and so on and all, of, all kinds of happenings took place or once and again, and uh, this is a wonderful uh, structure here that you can see here, and people love to go there, and it was a tragedy because actually it were not well calculated, uh, the anchoring of the sculpture and the little cushions uh, uh, were detached and everything was lost at the end. And what happened? Well, uh, the instant generated and the norms uh, started and your rules started. You couldn't uh, play guitar at night because you couldn't sleep, uh, you couldn't do this, and the shoes have to stay outside and so on and so forth. And, uh, and Prada said, no, no more cylinders, no more spheres. So a group of people took uh, remains of plastic that uh, uh, we took uh, sticks and we went to the mountain uh, and we created our own contra instant city, that is the protest city that were, we already had something to protest against. And uh, two weeks after we created that, and the people were even more fun. You could play guitar at night, at the, uh, during the day, you smoked, you did everything, you know, and, and you know, trips and acid was everywhere to be had. And you can imagine because uh, the, the, the trip was the main experience. But then the instant uh, started uh, going down, it ended and it ended. And what happened that? What happened then? People from Ibiza came to see this. What can they do with this uh, dismantled city? I, I think that they, they, they knew what to do with it. They took the, we, de, we deflated it, they came and they cut all the inflatables, they left the uh, buried parts outside and they took it in for years and years in the north coast of Ibiza. You could see it uh, full of spheres and colorful uh, cylinders. And it was wonderful, they uh, created a huge recycling uh, recycling uh, space and the city well it ended
it ended and then I'm going to read what Fernando and, you and I wrote which was published in La Vanguardia which was published in Coder which was published in Casabella which was published in many other magazines because we created a report of what the instant had been it was about creating a collective experience in which uh, work and experience would be the only channels of expression through which you could materialize an ephemeral uh, city uh, crea uh, showing the contradictions uh, of the uh, current industrial design. We, ha we have a technological constructive system with the application, as I have said, with technology and handicraft, intersections of cylinders and spheres uh, ex uh, created with uh, uh, strings that would absorb tensions, with uh, organic uh, doors, and with a lot of ingenious inventions. So the challenge was the concept of the instantaneous city, which is an ideological term that uh, is uh, against the city which designs and uh, traces the behavior of its inhabitants and also the awakening of a new conscience that uh, claims leisure as a product of our current technology to turn it into a specific work of human nature, which is creation. During the conference, the Instant City became an uh, advertising platform. We, uh, we, ha we had million, millions of uh, photographies, kilometers of film and the space uh, constru constructed that create that uh, acquired a very important formal significance but there's still uh, a question for the visitors and something which can be discussed by the delegates of the conference and the immense work accumulated we also have one million uh, staples that were manually placed and also the contradiction of a futuristic and the society uh, space and the society in its uh, within but once inside the sense the feeling of space escapes the usual the set the senses are altered and the sober overpressure in which is in principle invisible creates a certain magical disconcertment this uh, was public uh, published a lot. Maria José Ragué talked, said that in Ibiza had, Ibiza had replaced the music festivals, Woodstock and others because design had become and work the center of the meeting of the assembly. You didn't need uh, music anymore. You didn't need any complementary activities. Just the, the, the way to do things in the city and to uh, gather was already a manifestation. Quaderns published it, La Vanguardia, Casabella and many other publications. And 40 years later, yes, we have the Magba, uh, an exhibition that you can visit, in which Jose Maria Montaner said the other, the other day in El País about this exhibition, which what uh, is exhibited at the Magba is the truth, but not all the truth, because the instant was the anti-Congress, and it was born from with the idea of being not being aggressive, but on the other on the contrary, very kind, very affectionate, very parallel to the Congress, to the Congress delegates, but telling them, look, there is a different way. You, you, you don't have to, to talk so much about whether you need a switch here for the lamp or we need it there, because we're going to talk about other things related to design. Why not? It was nice, it was kind, but within this niceness, there was a contra-proposal uh, to their way of understanding design. And you see the Magba, for example, the exit and the Congress that had absorbed, as Jose Maria Montaner said, that the, the dissidents can be perfectly assimilated. And even indignados, uh, uh, now the outrage, uh, always assimilated by someone, by certain political parties or opportunistic uh, people that turns them into something else. Well, in order to finish this small story, my last minutes, Moses has left me some uh, more minutes in the uh, classroom. We will go then to the CB4. I, uh, for some years, uh, built, amongst other things, some inflatables with some of uh, the people. Fernando went to India with a van. I was, he was three, four years in India. Then he went to Egypt. He, uh, they, they stole the van from him. He was all, almost killed. And then I saw him when, uh, in, at the 25th anniversary of the exit, the instant, it was a remodelation and they did it in well. And I called him and he was in Murcia and I called him and he uh, hung, hung on one of those pictures and we spent two wonderful days. It was the only, the, the last time I saw him. He had an incurable disease and he had only 
two or, tw or thir 20 or 30 days more to live. What are the shadows? The shadows are that uh, the there are people, uh, of all the people that did that, of, apart from Jose Maria Prada, who is still the strong guy, there's nobody left. All the people that went with us are not there anymore. We talked a lot about uh, this story until uh, Iago told me, let it be. You have to tell it as it was. It's not your personal experiment. It's not your own story, your own personal trauma. Tell it as it was. In, 90, in 71, a history, a story that is worthwhile being told. Well, we created Inflatables. This was my first uh, encounter with Benidorm. In a previous one, Prada Pool told us that uh, they, it wouldn't be inflated because that inflatable was born from two spheres, arises from two spheres, a light sphere which uh, becomes a smaller, smaller one. And he said, of course. And then uh, when you do convexities and concavities, and Prada told us it's, it's not going to work, it's going to burst, or it's not going to inflate properly, it will deform. And of course, and it wasn't true, it did uh, form, it did uh, shape, and uh, of course the face of Jose Miguel when he came to the Feria del Campo in Madrid, it was uh, worthwhile seeing. I scondled, I scondled, and I scondled pavilion, commissioned us uh, to do that in the pavilion, and Prada came to see it, and it was a little bit like a prize for us. And that uh, was in Benidorm, and this is very beautiful. And then we started with the domes, but not us, no. I mean, other people and uh, assistants, and this is by Jose Maria Berenguer, the Weiberg, and uh, you know him. It's a sign, actually, a little bit of the geodesic uh, uh, domes uh, that he was doing with Fuller, and I had to do something commissioned by Archia, the uh, Architect Foundation, on Mr. Fuller, uh, because I was uh, passionate of Fuller. I started studying and then I had uh, uh, five and back then I had five uh, books that uh, I was given by my uh, current wife from er Hermes her publishing house and five ways of interpreting avant-garde <laughs> And uh, I really treasure them, and I keep rereading them 40 years later. Why? Because beyond the pioneers that we know, Corbusier and uh, Bright and so on, these people have interesting, very interesting interpretations, but you wouldn't understand very much without Tangen, without metabolists, and so on. This was the last geodesic that I helped uh, build, and look at what I did back then. I thought, what, am, what the hell is going to happen with architecture? Where do we have to go? And that came from what happened in Ibiza. And then I started to gather, to gather things and to create this poster. I drew it with rotring, I copied, and I was uh, making drawings. I show it in pieces because you can see it better. This is the hex uh, Edron by Paolo Soleri, the urban utopia by Feuerstein, the pneumatic cells of Jungmann, the archigram by Peter Cook, Jonah Friedman, Cousteau, structures under sea, Mr. Fuller covering uh, Manhattan with a dome of 32 kilometers, Heron, the cities of the Japanese metabolists like Izozaki, Kurokawa, and this is what's going, what was going to be the new century architecture. Look how wrong, nothing, absolutely nothing, only, uh, only semi-detached detached houses with uh, slated roofs. Well, and then I had this study, which was a workshop in the Riera San Miguel, where we worked, and I had to think about, I was working with, uh, very close to Bofil. I partnered up with Javier Vague Bofil, who left the uh, workshop because uh, he believed, like Ricardo, in that uh, history. And then uh, we went to Caspe Street, and we worked on some other projects, but I wanted to highlight this one, which was a contest for Santiago de Chile in the last days of 
Allende. When we submitted the exercise, a week after that, Allende passed away. And uh, we did it because uh, you could already see that that regime, that other utopia, was something similar to Ibiza, which was an utopia. And we were militant uh, in that moment, and we said, well, we have to do something for this Chilean. And uh, we have, uh, together with O'Higgins, we created and we submitted our work to this contest with other people from all around the world. Of course, the contest uh, didn't lead to anything. And I think that uh, ten, ten, uh, and, uh, after 10 years of uh, military uh, dictatorship, uh, Pinochet, we were sent a letter saying that we had gotten a little, pri a little prize, but that it was not going to be built. The last picture is this one. Fortunately, I was uh, very paying close attention to uh, what Koderk did. He when he was signing his houses. I'll tell you about that in another one of the classes. We will talk about typologies. We will talk about Koderk. And then in the 60s, I uh, had the occasion with a friend who was a, a constructor to build these houses in San Just. They're still there, actually. Uh, 40 years have gone by, and they're made of bricks. Uh, they're very similar to Koderik's typology. Yes. Okay, this has been the class. Now we're going to go to CB4 because uh, we are going uh, to uh, introduce ourselves as teachers that we're going to have, and we will start to create the groups. And the topic will be given to you on Wednesday, the day after tomorrow, after tomorrow, and Anna Soler, together with all the teachers, well, Anna, well, we believe that it's uh, beautiful, that you're going to have fun, that you're going to have a very fun year. Welcome, and I hope that you have a blast this year. You're going to, I'm sure, have a very good time this year.